student, or um, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm going to tailor or customize what I have to say for the character of my audience. And therefore, I'm going to ask for a show of hands, because you're a very mixed group. Some of you are veterans, having had your ailment for a long time. And some of you are newbies, newly diagnosed or not even yet diagnosed. And some of you are very sophisticated in your medical knowledge. And you've come really to hear what's new and what's hot, what could be applied to you. And others of you don't know a great deal about this condition and, or these conditions and what to do. And you want general information and to be educated. And so I'm going to try to cover both areas. But I'd like to know how many in this audience are newly diagnosed or you would consider yourself newbies. Raise your hands, please. So we have a fair sprinkling of such. And I take it the rest are veterans, or at least uh, know a bit. If that is so, raise your hands, please. OK. Well, I'll ask uh, indulgence of the veterans if I am simple in some of the things I say. And I assure you, I'll have complicated, more advanced information for you as we go along also. And so with that, with that being said, let us proceed. We are in the age of genes and chromosomes and molecular medicine. And what do these tremendous, gigantic pumpkins have to do with that? Well, they exemplify what happens with mutation of genes. Genes regulate growth. They regulate tumor growth. They regulate what kind of tumors you get. And when the genes are mutated, here's what can happen. Now, the body is made up of cells, actually over 230 different types of cells, like the bricks or the things that make up our house. Bricks, wood, wires, metal, etc. And each cell can undergo abnormal growth and turn into a cancer. This is a possibility. And so we have a wide variety of cancers or malignancies possible. And the characteristics of each one may be different. And the growth rate may be different, their degree of aggressiveness. And so we, we want to know when we diagnose carcinoid or a related neuroendocrine tumor, and I'll explain more about that term in a moment. We want to know what is the aggressiveness of such a growth. And so we have the term differentiation. Here's a brick wall. Every brick is the same. They all look like the model from which they were made. These would be well-differentiated cells if these were representing tumor cells. So it would be a well-differentiated tumor, which would mean it would be a slow grower. And here's one where there's some variation. You see some different colors, but otherwise pretty much similar. So this is a moderately differentiated representation. And that's what we would say in describing a tumor with the cells of the tumor varying a little bit. And then here's one where the stones of this wall are all different. Different colors, different sizes, different shapes. That's a poorly differentiated. And applied to a tumor, for example, the cells of the tumor, if they don't look just like the cell of origin, that is the type of cell from which they arose, then they would not be well differentiated. They would go on to moderate or poorly differentiated. And that type of, of characterization is very important in determining what's going to happen, the prediction of this tumor, is of its course, and also in decisions as to treatment. 
both medicine and how aggressive one should be in the treatment. Now, let's, with that being said, let's go on a little bit. First, uh, you're not in the wrong place. This is not a dog show. But, <laughs> but I want to point out that these dogs, or canines, they all belong to the canine family. But yet, look at the difference, the variation, different breeds. And so similarly, there are a bunch of different kinds of neuroendocrine tumors, but they're all neuroendocrine tumors, but different in, in each type. And similarly, even within the different types, particularly carcinoid, which comprises three quarters of all the neuroendocrine tumors, so we talk about it the most because it's the commonest, in the carcinoids, there is variations. They're not all identical. So it's not one shoe or one treatment fits all. It has to be customized for the individual tumor. Now, just a word about neuroendocrine tumors. Why, why do we call them that? How did they get that name? What does it mean? This is uh, of some interest to the, most everybody, I should think. The body has nerves, neural tissue, and the nerves have a, nu a cell, a, a nucleus, and then long extensions, and they carry signals. They transmit messages down these, like a, like a wire that takes a signal. And these are very, very weak, minute electrical signals. And, but the main purpose of nerve tissue is to transmit messages. Now, endocrine tissue, endocrine glands, endocrine cells also exist for transmitting messages, but they don't do it by electrical currents. They do it by producing hormones or chemicals, which are extruded into the circulation and then cause a response at some distant spot, or even extruded locally and cause some sort of a local reaction. Well, these two cell, cell types, neural and endocrine, do have the common function of sending messages. And then there's a group of cells now called neuroendocrine cells, part of the diffuse neuroendocrine cell system, in which the cells have features of both nerve tissue and endocrine tissue. They have little granules of substance within them, and they produce different substances depending upon the particular type of cell that they represent. And so the name neuroendocrine is applied to those and abbreviated as NET. So NETS means neuroendocrine tumors. And that's what we're talking about today. And as I said, 75% of them are carcinoid. The rest, as I'll show you, are an assortment of different types, which are quite rare, even rarer than the carcinoids, and yet very important and sharing in many similarities. All right. These are solid malignant tumors. Malignant is the key word here, as versus benign. They're not all malignant from the start. They may become malignant as time goes by, or malignant synonymous with cancer. Cancer, though, doesn't have to mean something that progresses rapidly. These are usually very slow growers. But nonetheless, if left un unchanged, they may become fatal. The, uh, what you see mentioned here of neuroendocrine cells are enterochromaffin-like cells. That refers to the type of staining characteristic. They, they will stain with chromium salts. And this is important because this is how the pathologist helps to prove that that's the kind of tumor he's dealing with. They do produce different substances, as you see. Now, very important is the question of functional and non-functional. You'll hear that term a great deal. And what that means is when these tumors grow, they may develop the ability to produce excessive amounts of whatever their basic hormone was, and so cause symptoms from an excess of it. So these are then called functional tumors. 
they have an endocrine function. Some tumors, the majority, don't produce enough to cause symptoms, so these are called non-functional tumors. However, many of them, even if they don't cause symptoms from an excess, will have a little bit more than is normal, and we can measure those things in the blood. They are called markers. They're tumor markers, and we can keep track of the growth of the tumor or the response to treatment by measuring the markers. And we're finding some new ones, as I'll tell you later. So that's increasing our ability to precisely determine what's going on, and in some instances helps us to devise new treatments. Now, we've divided neuroendocrine tumors, particularly carcinoids, by their location. And th from where they arise. And this is very important because it relates to what to expect in symptoms, what to expect in the prog progression of the disease, what to determine might be the best treatment. Because to carcinoids say from certain areas of the body respond better to certain medicines than the carcinoids from elsewhere. Traditionally, we call them foregut tumors, meaning tumors that arise basically from structures that are, ar arose above the diaphragm in the chest, in the lung, in, in the upper, in the stomach, for example, but also in the pancreas because pancreas embryologically derives from the so-called foregut. And then midgut is the most common site for carcinoid. That would be the small bowel and the right side of the colon. Hindgut means anything from the right, from the mid colon on down distally, including the rectum, which is a very important spot because many carcinoids arise there. Now there are some additional sites. We're not sure whether the, which classification to put them in. They're very uncommon, the ovary, the parathyroid, and the adrenal gland. Now, very important also is for the pathologist to grade the tumor. That means to tell us whether it's high grade, moderate, or low grade. That helps to tell us what its behavior is going to be. And again, the differentiation I just mentioned before, and we'll go into this further in a minute. A word or two about the incidence. These uh, figures derive from studies of the SEER project. So, uh, that means Surveillance Epidemiology and End Result Project, a many decades project mainly sponsored through the Public Health Service uh, of the United States over a long, long time and following uh, malignancies, cancers of various types. So in a review of over 35,000 cases from 1973 to 2004, uh, it was found that these tumors uh, have become increasingly frequent, at least increasingly frequently reported. I don't think that uh, there's really an increased occurrence of them. I think there's just an increased awareness, and therefore every uh, decade in the last three, we've seen a doubling of the number of cases reported. And that's not because of an epidemic, but rather because of better diagnosis and better awareness. And we've also learned that there's at least twice as many cases that haven't been reported. So though rare, it's not that extremely rare. Uh, it, it is still considered an orphan disease. At the present time, a bit over five new cases are reported per year, per 100,000 of the general population. And, but because it's slow growers and people live a long time with it and are doing better and better now, we have well over 100,000 cases walking the streets of our country and, of course, many more elsewhere in the world. And here, to break down into where these tumors arise. As I said before, three quarters of neuroendocrine tumors uh, of the carcinoids 
uh, 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 three quarters of all neuroendocrine tumors are comprised by carcinoid, and most of them, two thirds, arise in the gastroenteropancreatic GEP system, or in other words, the gut. Uh, Twenty-six or twenty-eight percent arise in the lung pulmonary. That's the second commonest spot, and pulmonary carcinoids are on the increase perhaps because of better diagnosis. Uh, other a small percent come from a, an assortment of unusual locations, which I mentioned before. Now, of the non-carcinoid neuroendocrine tumors, and you see them listed below, these tumors uh, are either non-functioning, but they may produce a substance called pancreatic polypeptide, so they're called PPOMAs. Uh, and they all arise from the islet cells of the pancreas. And this is different from ordinary pancreatic cancer. And like we heard about Steve Jobs, and he was just called pancreatic cancer initially. And uh, that's a simplification. It's, it was a net. At any rate, insulinoma is the commonest of the functioning uh, neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas and that produces insulin, and so patients get symptoms of hypoglycemia. Gastronoma is the next commonest functioning. These patients get unusual and severe ulcer disease because it produ these tumors produce gastrin substance that stimulates stomach acid. Then the next quite uncommon is vipoma. These tumors produce VIP, vas vasoactive, uh, uh, intestinal uh, polypeptide, and this substance stimulates secretions of fluid in the intestine, so it causes a profound watery diarrhea. It's actually uh, called pancreatic cholera because it's that, that severe. Uh, next, we have glucagonoma. Glucagon is the opposite of insulin. It elevates the blood sugar, and these people get diabetes and a host of other symptoms that accompany that. Then we have very rare things like somatostatinoma. This is a, a, a hormone that, the, that can produce diabetes and also gallstones, and this is one of the rarer nets. And then there are a group of other, even rarer types of uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors Almost any hormone that the body can make can be produced by one or another of these pancreatic tumors. So we can have <coughs> acromegaly, for example, uh, overgrowth, and a bunch of other symptoms. I need, where, what happened to Jim? <laughs> I need uh, computer assistance here, it's stuck. It's pretty bad, Ollie wants to follow me. <laughs> There's a question whether I married Cindy for the dog or the dog because of me. Uh, it's frozen. It's frozen. That's not good. It's Vista. Let me see. I might, I might go to that, but I'm going to see if I can get it to end it. 